Sarah, hi. Hi, Russ. How are you? Long time no see. Yeah, long time no see. I, I'm in the desert today. So um, I now to the sun, I've got like actually some color in my face. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting, the change of environment. Um, you know, it's just, um, it's really beautiful here. I love it. Yeah, environment is everything. Yeah. Send a bit of that sunshine over, please. I will. Is it raining again? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Well, I'm seeing shaking heads on both sides. Sarah, why don't we introduce our guest and, and start talking today? Yes, we have lovely uh, Leslie Kenny on uh, the show today. Uh, and she's going to talk to us specifically about spermidine, but I'm sure she's got a lot to contribute about the whole field of longevity. Um, a fellow sufferer of the rain, but from your neck of the woods, I believe. So thank hi, Leslie. It's so, yeah, so glad that you came on today. Well, thank you both for inviting me. And yes, I'm a Southern Californian who is a, a sunshine refugee. I'm now living in the rain with Sarah. <laughs> well, well yeah. where about from Southern California, Leslie? Orange County. Same here. We're, I'm from oh. Huntington Beach. I grew up in Huntington Beach. So. Okay. So I went to Tustin High School. <laughs> so oh, awesome. it's a little bit further down. Yeah. Yes, yes. We probably were graduating the same time, enjoying Tears for Fears at our prom. And going, uh, you know. <laughs> on, on the QE2, that's right. Um, I graduated high school in 1983. So Too I might be away. a little bit older than you, not much. So, so that is a perfect segue um, because I, you know, guessing our age by how we look is actually. Uh, not easy anymore because some of us are employing some of our hacks to uh, to reduce aging and to reduce the effects of aging. Uh, and Sarah and I are on a mission this season because we both turned 50 to really understand what can we do to reduce this salt and pepper that's happening, even though my wife loves it. I work with a bunch of 30 year olds who can completely identify that I'm a lot older than they are. Um, but it's more than this, that it's, you know, what else? It, I feel older. I feel sluggish. I'm tired. All those things. Uh, and I'm sure, Leslie, you have some some tips and tricks that you can share with us. I do indeed. If you want to go straight into the gray hair hacks, I am all about it. I think I have around 54 videos on YouTube and many of them are to do with reversing gray hair. So very happy to go there if that's where you want to start. Um, just let me know. I'm yeah, let Sarah and, choose yeah. The oh, I was going to say, yeah, let, let's do that because I didn't know you had all those videos. And, and why specifically that? I mean, is that do you think that's what a lot of people when they're kind of on this journey, that's what a lot of people are starting off with? Actually, it was a response to a lot of my girlfriends. So um, I mentioned I graduated high school in 1983. I was one of the younger members of my high school um, graduating class. I am going to be 58 in June in a couple of months time, and I still don't have to dye my hair. And uh, as COVID was happening, a lot of my girlfriends whose raccoon stripes were beginning to show would say, how did you get your hair dyed? Who, who is dyeing your hair? Right? Because they assumed I had some hairdresser under wraps who was able to do this at home. And I said, I, I don't do anything. But I was rather astonished to see that they did. I hadn't realized that so many people actually dye their hair. And the more I asked, they would say, well, I started doing this when I was 35. Or I did this. I've been doing this for 20 years, which astonished me. And so I thought, well, I'll just put up a few videos on YouTube just to share with them what I think probably helps. And as soon as I did it, I started getting lots of questions from people. And sometimes their cases were so, so sad. Very, very young people, uh, say 19 year olds who were going prematurely gray and I would call them and we would have a bit of a, you know, a bit of a chat about what was happening in their life. And it might have been something like a row Accutane that they were taking that had led to, say, hair loss or premature gray hair. And these are side effects that are listed in the, uh, you know, 
as the contraindications in the packaging for Roaccutane. It's just that nobody is willing to talk about it. So I would learn about that. I would learn about uh, people who had H. pylori infections and how then after the H. pylori took hold, they began to get gray hair and they couldn't reverse it. And then I, you know, I realized, oh, if you look in, in PubMed, there are all these studies on the link between H. pylori and premature gray hair, or equally things like thyroid issues, um, hyperthyroidism leading to hair loss and hypothyroidism leading to both loss and loss of pigmentation, which if you restored the thyroid hormones, people were getting the color back. So I put these videos up. Um, by the way, one of them was to do with vitamin D. So Russ, the fact you're in Arizona uh, or in the desert, wherever it is you are, that might help. Uh, with that salt and pepper beard. So vitamin D is actually one of the uh, deficiency. Vitamin D deficiency is one of the causes of gray hair. And there is literature, scientific literature on this. And so I put these videos up and then people started taking the advice and sending me before and after videos or pictures. And um, I have not added to that library of content because I've been so busy running my company and running, you know, the Oxford Longevity Project. But that content just continues over on Leslie's new prime on YouTube. It just continues to generate subscribers. I, I don't have a lot. I think maybe 12,000 now, but people are interested. Yeah, it's significant. And, and you know, I really had no idea. I was thinking more about Yes, it's an, an aging thing. And obviously toxins and things are gonna play their part, but you know, you don't you don't make those connections so much to do with illnesses, drug side effects, certainly. You know, I hadn't made that connection. So is that one of the the main tips that you have for this is is to, you know, either wean yourself off the drugs or to think about what you're taking? I mean, what is your general advice for those people? My philosophy is always bring the body back to balance. Once it is at that center point, it knows how to fix everything. As we get older, we generate deficiencies in things. We don't, perhaps the gut biome has been exposed to broad spectrum antibiotics. We're not manufacturing B vitamins uh, at the levels that we did before. Maybe our stomach acid has changed because of leaky gut or because of chronic infection. Could be candida. It doesn't have to be um, H. pylori. Uh, when that happens, we don't absorb our nutrients as well. So maybe we need digestive enzymes, right? And um, so there are all of these things that if we just top up our deficiencies, make sure that we don't have too much or too little of anything, that we're in that kind of Goldilocks zone, the body then has all the resources that it needs to, uh, to fix things. And of course, one of those things is spermidine too. Um, but there are many other things. I would be misleading people to say that there is just a, you know, there, there is a, um, you know, silver bullet that you can take. We're each bio-individual. And that means that the deficiencies that we have, um, you know, mine will be different from Sarah's, which will be different from Russ's. And we've got to work with our practitioners to measure, right? Um, we can't manage or change what we can't measure. And so we measure everything from C-reactive protein to uh, levels of vitamins and nutrients, antioxidants like glutathione status, which will tell us about our liver health. And, uh, and then, of course, check for any chronic infections, check for leaky gut. Um, dysbiosis itself is one of the new hallmarks of aging, one of the new 12 hallmarks of aging. So, um, you know, when you then can address those things as well as hormonal imbalances, and I cannot stress thyroid hormone enough for both men and women, although it is primarily uh, something we associate more with women, especially women who have had multiple children, uh, I would say that uh, if we can top all those things up, then the body stands a much greater chance of um, of saying, all right, now the tissues are in, and organs are in good shape. I can take some of these extra resources and allocate them to the things that we don't really care about that are not necessary to the survival of the organism, like hair color, because that's actually frivolous. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. We talked to um, the the Young Goose team and, and, and vanity always tends to be a great way to to teach people about taking better care of themselves when they start to realize that like, I'm losing my hair. Um, I, my beard is gray. I have these wrinkles. Um, but, but there's also a part of it where it's a great entry point into like just understanding that there, you have health issues or that there are things that you can do to address those. And I think sometimes your body talks to you and shows you that maybe you need to um, do a little work as well. I, I think, you know, the natural parts of aging are, are interesting because they're, they're naturally what your body goes through. Um, maybe unnaturally you're graying early, but I'm in my fifties. I'm okay. Having gray hair. I do not want to lose my hair, but I'm taking some, I, I'm taking action to try to not lose my hair. Um, but it's all vanity. I, I just want to live longer. If I don't look amazing, at least I'm here to see my children have their children. I can continue to create and write and do the things I love to do. But if we combine those things and look at what you just mentioned, things like your thyroid um, and, and making sure you have a healthy thyroid. If you're on thyroid replacement, which I'm on, I'm on Lavoxyl um, because I had radiation treatment when I was in my 20s. How, how, do you, how do you address some of those things where if you are on medication, um, mine is medication because I radi I got it irradiated and it doesn't actually work. But in some cases, maybe there are ways to get your body back to the balance part of what you said. Um, and can you actually, I mean, I know this is, we're not medical doctors, but can you actually get people to get off of those medications? Because those medications are actually really tough on your body too. Well, it really depends. So I am hypothyroid. I am a Hashimoto's patient. So I've had three, I've been diagnosed with three different autoimmune conditions, Hashimoto's being one, lupus and rheumatoid arthritis being the others. And uh, because of the Hashimoto's, I have one eighth of a thyroid left as seen on a sonogram. And I take, I don't take levothyroxine because I am a poor converter of the raw T4 thyroid, the precursor to the bioavailable T3. And therefore, I really need desiccated pig's thyroid because it's already there. It has T4, T3, even T2, T1, T0. And some of these things, we don't know what the benefit is of, say, T0. Um, T2, we have a little bit. We have some studies on it. But um, I think that, that finding which thyroid hormone works best for you is very important. I've met so many thyroid patients, hypothyroid patients, who are on levothyroxine. And they say, I still can't shift the weight. I'm exhausted. I have brain fog. Uh, I've got cold hands and cold feet, and my. Are you doctor... reading my journal? Are you reading my? Are you reading my health <laughs> journal, Leslie? Well, so so then their doctors increase the dose of T4, but the problem is that some of us are genetically not able to convert T4 into T3 as well. We can do it a little bit, but not very well, and that's me. And you can do, at least here in Great Britain, you can do a genetic test with Genova Diagnostics, and you can then see whether or not you're a poor converter. Take that test to your GP in Britain because they're generally loath to prescribe you T3, and we cannot get desiccated pig's thyroid in the UK. Unfortunately, we can't get it prescribed on the NHS. And then you can make the case, but if you are on levothyroxine, you've never tried um, desiccated pig's thyroid, perhaps try it. And, you know, Bernie Saunders is on levothyroxine. Hillary Clinton is on desiccated pig's thyroid. Um, they're both doing well. Some people do very well on levothyroxine alone. Others, like me, do terrible on it. And I will say that it is, it's not just about you personally feeling better, but women of childbearing age, I have met a number of women who have lost babies at the five month mark. Um, if you lose a baby at five months and you've got to basically birth that baby, it's got to go through the birth canal. It's absolutely traumatic. And these were all women who were on T4. They were in their reproductive years. They got pregnant. 
the body knows if the baby is not getting enough thyroid hormone and the mother has got to provide for the baby's thyroid in utero, neurologically, the baby is not going to be healthy. And so the body aborts and it is absolutely traumatic. But I have met far too many women, among them nurses, who have been on levothyroxine, who are overweight, um, who say, this is not how I should be. I'm moving constantly, but I just can't shift the weight and I'm still so cold. And is there anything that can be done? And I always say, I think you're going to need T3 or the desiccated pig's thyroid. I'm sorry for the pigs, but thank you, pigs, for your desiccated <laughs> T3. I, and I, I don't want to get too lost on the, on thyroid, but thyroid's a really important thing. And I, I've been on it since I was 23 years old um, after the radiation. So I I don't know a life before it. All I know is that after I finished my treatment, I was falling asleep at work and I could not lose weight. My hair was thinning and I was 23 years old. And I was like, this is great. And the minute I went on it, I felt, I felt normal again, I guess normal, you know, and, but now as I'm getting older, I have never changed my dosage. I have gone and tested and, um, I'm pretty regulated, but I, you know, maybe my thyroid is what's causing this bloating, um, you know, thinning hair, or maybe it's just me not being healthy. I don't know. But I have, I mean, the thing is, Sarah and I have worked very hard this season mm -hmm. specifically we on have, yeah. incorporating more exercise. I've been doing hit exercising. Uh, my diet has sh shifted. I've been on, um, I've been on a, a much different um, type of supplement and I'm still complaining about the same things about the bloating, can't lose weight. So I will go address that. Thank you, Leslie, for that. Let's talk about spermidine, though, because I don't want to lose track on the importance of that as well. And, um, and I don't know, Sarah, let's let, let's talk about spermidine because are, do you take it, Sarah? I've been taking, yeah, I have been taking spermidine. Yeah, I've been taking an, and um, Leslie's going to tell us all about it, but there, there are two different ones from, from your company, Leslie, from Oxford Company, which the gluten-free one, um, a green one. With made with chlor chlorella, I believe, and the the other one, and I've been taking them both together, and I do think it's one of the supplements where you can really feel a difference. And I have to say, for people who know me, I had rosacea all up my face for a long time, and I don't know whether it's coincidence because obviously I do a lot of hacks at the same time, but it has gone, it has completely gone now. Like there's nothing there at all. And the other thing that I notice is. That I do get very hungry when I'm on the spermidine. So I'm having a bit of a break because I tend to cycle my supplements and I'm actually out of spermidine right now. So I'm kind of on the longevity, the the um, particular ones we're going to talk about later in the series. But I, I kind of have had a good, I would say, six months on spermidine. So please, Leslie, tell us all about it because... Um, it is something actually that we very, very briefly touched on last week because we had Don Moxley on, who I'm sure you know, Leslie. Don Moxley has his own brand, um, but that's not the, the one I've been on. I've been on the Oxford Lifespan one. So maybe you can just kind of fill us in because it's a weird old name. And whenever I mention it to anybody, they kind of give me a bit of a funny look, you know, this spermidine thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, spermidine is a polyamine that just is a fancy word for meaning it is um, made from amino acids. And a lot of us are taking amino acids in the form of collagen or branch chain amino acids if we're bodybuilding. Um, so people have been on these amino acids. The name is really unfortunate. However, it speaks to the importance of this molecule to all human life. So spermidine is found in high quantities in sperm where uh, DNA is able to wrap itself around spermidine rather than a histone bond, which is much bigger. Um, and that just allows the DNA to fit more tightly into a very tiny um, sperm so that it can move around faster, get to the egg faster. Uh, it's also present because when sperm is made, it's a very high reactive oxygen species event. And it's an anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant. So it actually helps with all of that ROS. But it's found in all plants, in particular in very high quantities in the endosperm of seeds. So things like wheat germ or rice bran, 
um, any kind of seeds like that, it's going to be in higher quantities. So soybeans in particular. So if we think about um, fermented foods, which also have uh, these polyamines, so spermidine is one, spermine often comes with it, putrescine, they're all lovely names. That's a precursor to both. Um, that would also be in these fermented foods, also in the endosperm. Um, these are so important for human health and for the survival of the next generation that uh, they come in high quantities also in human breast milk. And breast milk also has fructooligosaccharides, which are there to feed the bacteria that the mother bequeaths to the baby as the baby passes through the birth canal, presses up against the cecum, gets that bacterial load. Um, those bacterial colonies are going to be fed by the fructooligosaccharides, those resistant fibers in mother's milk. If you can imagine, mother's milk has something that the baby can't digest at all. It's only for the mitochondria. Those FOS go to those bacteria and the bacteria can make more spermidine and spermine. So the, um, you want these, uh, these polyamines because they allow the baby to grow or they allow the plant to grow. That's why they are in the endosperm, in the seed, so that that seed or that baby can grow. And we ourselves, I alluded to the fact that we can make it in our gut biome. Um, we can get it from food, from plants primarily, or we can also get it um, made in our tissues. So when we're young, for instance, when we're babies, we have the highest concentration of spermidine and spermine that we'll ever have in our lives. But as we get older, that ability of our tissues to manufacture actually declines. And we need to then either upregulate the gut biome's ability to, uh, to manufacture these polyamines, or we need to then get it from plants. And that means increasing the amount of plants that we take in. Uh, you can get it from chicken liver, for instance, or duck liver. So maybe foie gras is actually a superfood. I don't know. But um, from any kind of bird, you can, you can get it. Um, so this is, you know, this is where it occurs in nature. What are its superpowers? It actually will inhibit nine of the 12 hallmarks of aging. And these include things like stem cell dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction, telomere shortening, inflammation, uh, gut dysbiosis, and autophagy, dysfunctional autophagy. So um, autophagy is your body's natural cleanup process, cellular cleanup process. Uh, all of our tissues and organs are based on those cells. So we really need to get down to that foundational level and make sure the cells are in optimal health. Um, so autophagy will basically get rid of, it's a quality control for the cells, gets rid of anything that is not working and allows the cell to, uh, you know, to perform at its peak. But I'm, I'm thinking, Sarah, back to your rosacea comment, and we have had other people say that their rosacea has also gone after starting. And I wonder if it has to do both with inflammation as well as mitochondrial health. And the reason why is I've got a paper here, which is all about mitochondrial health and skin aging. And was just thinking that possibly there is, you know, there's a connection there as well. Yeah, and, and maybe also you said there is a connection with the gut microbiome because I think quite often, you know, when you get these skin disorders, it's kind of telling you that you've got something going on with your gut. Yeah, yeah. Because it's the same thing, you know, the lining of your gut is kind of, this, you know, it's the same as the lining on the outside is the same as the lining on the inside. So, you know, I wonder whether that could be what's going on too. Yes. Um, so a couple of comments there. One is that I wanted to formulate um, primidine, which is our supplement, the way that breast milk was formulated. So mm -hmm. it has the polyamines, uh, spermidine, spermine for DNA methylation and putrescine, but it also has a fructooligosaccharide. So it's exactly like it's 50-50, just like it occurs in breast milk. And there is a great study out of uh, Barcelona 
uh, probably in October of last year, which looked at mothers and uh, mothers who were breastfeeding, looked at the polyamine content in the breast milk and looked at what was happening to the babies. And those mothers who were normal body weight had higher levels of the polyamines and their babies, um, the gut lining was, um, was sealing up faster. At the same time, it was activating the immune cells in the gut. And the reason that's important is that if you follow then those children over the next few years, they have fewer allergies because the polyamines have essentially matured the, uh, the immune cells in the gut such that they can handle these other food substances that are coming their way. So we do know that it has this ability to, uh, to tighten up, well, to seal up those tight junctions. And that is naturally really important for any autoimmune conditions um, where, you know, you might have undigested proteins that go through those tight junctions in the gut that have been loosened up and the body then mounts an attack and says, what are these proteins in the bloodstream? They definitely don't belong here. Let's get rid of them. But then because some of them ident some of them look very closely like, say, the proteins on our thyroid or the proteins in our hair follicles or the proteins in our joints, we then get, you know, uh, Hashimoto's or alopecia or rheumatoid arthritis, right? So yeah, definitely, definitely making sure the gut is balanced and that that one cell thick lining of the gut wall is very tight. That's really important. I think it is one of uh, spermidine's superpowers. And I've often wondered if um, people always say that they notice their hair, skin, and nails changing when they take primidine and that their hair grows faster and their nails grow faster. And if you think about it, any area of the body that has high cellular turnover, like hair, skin, and nails, is a proxy for other parts of the body that we can't see that also have high cellular turnover, such as the gut lining, which renews itself every 72 hours. Right. Yeah. That's so, I mean, how did you get into all this, Leslie? Because of you, you obviously such a wealth of knowledge that you, you know, you're kind of so granular on, on the detail and actually a lot of what you're saying, I already knew, but you're saying it in a way that kind of like, oh yeah, of course it's recognizing, you know, it's recognizing the skin cell as something foreign, you know, it's, uh, you have a very good way of putting it over. What, what was your kind of trajectory to get where you are? Well, I, I didn't do, you know, I think I did AP biology in high school and that was it um, and didn't go into the sciences at all. No, I was, you know, on the economics and business side of things. So I have a, an undergraduate degree in Chinese economics from UC Berkeley and an MBA from, from Harvard, but I'm a patient. And when you're a patient, it's personal. And I'm sure, Russ, you understand this, right? Uh, I will read any scientific paper if I think that my life depends on it. And when I was 39, I was very burnt out. I just finished uh, you know, running an online matchmaking company in Hong Kong. I moved to Colorado, to Boulder, Colorado and started noticing some pain in my joints and in my hands and just went to the doctor to check it out. And I said, I think this is what I imagine arthritis would be like. We got the, the blood test back, but rather than the nurse calling me to say, oh, your tests are back and they're normal. I got the call directly from the doctor saying, could you please come in? And so go in to see the doctor I'm braced for the fact this obviously is not a normal consult if she's called me in personally. And she she says, oh, you're right. It was indeed arthritis. It's rheumatoid arthritis. As a, a Swati student, or as you know, a, a sort of one of those students who's always looking to get the right answer, I was like, oh, fantastic. I got that. That answer is right. Hooray. And then she said, but you've also got something else, which is called lupus, which I'd never heard of before. And because I was in the middle of my fifth IVF cycle and I was using donor eggs 
uh, Colorado turns out to be very aggressive to getting you to use donor eggs. Um, and I said, hey, this is really inconvenient. I'm doing this, uh, this IVF cycle. I'm using donor eggs. There's a lot writing on this. It's not just financial. It's kind of emotional because I can't keep going through IUIs and IVFs and this is too much. And she just said, don't do it. And you have a good five years left. There's no point, right? Why would you have kids? That was her message. And I thought, wait a second, you can't say that. I'm thinking, you can't say that. <laughs> You're the doctor. What's the answer? Because I'm paying you to give me the answer. So that's not the answer I want. So give me the answer I want. And she said, I'm sorry, there's nothing. We have no treatment for it. You can take these drugs, Enbrel and Humira, which are immune suppressants for your rheumatoid arthritis, but there's nothing we can do for the lupus. And uh, I just thought, okay, that clearly wrong answer. So maybe the test is wrong. Is the test wrong? Can we test again? And she agreed that we could indeed test again because it was, after all, my insurance that was paying for it. When I left that afternoon, I was determined to do anything I could to reverse what I had and to prove her wrong, right? And so I did tons of research, so much research, and discovered that the root cause of those two diseases is inflammation. So I went on an anti-inflammatory diet, and then I looked at the treatments, and the treatments are immune suppressants. Um, so I'm half Taiwanese, and philosophically, because my mother is from Taiwan, and this is the East, philosophically, the idea of suppressing the immune system makes no sense to me. Why would you do that? You need your immune system. Shouldn't you balance the immune system instead? And so I thought, let's now just not think about these immune suppressants, which anyway don't work on lupus. Let's think about balancing the immune system. And then I did all this research and came across something called intravenous immunoglobulin, which to this day, I meet doctors who do not know about it for autoimmune conditions. And uh, it was pretty experimental in 2004, but I did two rounds cost me 24,000 US dollars in total. I've heard that now a single treatment, not 12,000, but can be as high as 90,000 US dollars. That's inflation for you. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And, but I went into remission when I went back and I tested, having removed the triggers of my overreactive immune system, having balanced my immune system. So it wouldn't, it would stay in the Goldilocks zone, right? Uh, I was then, I came back with a, with a great C-reactive protein number, my cytokines and my tumor necrosis factor alpha, all of those things had dropped. And when she said, well, look at that, you don't have these things anymore. I just thought, oh my God, yes, I'm thrilled about that. But that means you were wrong. And if I would have listened, I would have accepted that I had five years left to live and there was nothing I could do. And that's not true. And that is where I can't help but try to learn more for other patients like me so that they can be empowered to take back their health. And this is good for doctors. I have no disrespect for doctors. What they do is wonderful. And on the acute care side, they are superheroes. But on the chronic health side, there is so much that we patients can do. And we're going to have to. Because all economies that have these large populations of older people, we are heading straight for uh, the iceberg of massive debt that we're going to saddle our kids with to take care of older people. Yeah, and we're, are the baby boomers are, are are there, right? And 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 it's something interesting you you said there, Leslie. And I know many people in my life who have lupus, and it's painful. It's actually a very painful thing, right? Like couple that with rheumatoid arthritis, all of a sudden you've got a very painful thing you're dealing with. It's not just being told you have five good years, but it's actually dealing with chronic pain, I, I imagine. Yeah. So there's, there's that. And as a woman, I have met so many other patients who have heard my story who say, I, I took the immune suppressants and, uh, and I've, I often are a Hashimoto's lupus. They often come together. 
And they'll say, but I'm desperate for a baby. I'm 41. I really want to have a baby and I can't get pregnant. But they're on, they're on various drugs. They have the pain. That urge for some women to have babies is very, very strong, especially as they get older. And uh, some of them have gone on methotrexate, which is a chemotherapy drug. Now, once you do that, that's not so good for your eggs. And I feel, I feel so sad for them because I have been that woman who desperately wanted a baby and was told, no, you're infertile. And so I know what it's like. And uh, it's a horrible feeling. So I'm hopeful that if I share my story, there'll be fewer of these women who go down that road, which is not only painful, as you've mentioned, Russ, but, you know, they can't have children if they want. It's very difficult. Yeah. And, and Leslie, I know, I mean, I know you have a daughter, so not only have you kind of gone down the road and kind of dealt with your inflammation and actually worked out what needed to happen, you've, you've kind of just, you know, pushed forward with your life. You, you've got a, a daughter, you've got a company, and now you're trying to kind of get this message out. What, now, explain a little bit about your company then, because this must play an integral part into kind of your message and how you're trying to push that out. I mean, I had no idea that you'd kind of gone through all of that because I've met you in person. You know, I would never think that you'd been that ill. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. And I think that's, you know, if people see my hands, they say, how could you have had rheumatoid arthritis? Because I don't have any of the joint deformation that we associate with that illness. Now I have two daughters. My eldest is adopted from China because I just needed to get my life, you know, on Wanted to have a family, and that's a wonderful way to build a family. But my uh, my second daughter is biological, and that happened as soon as I got the thyroid working, within two weeks. And the doctor who prescribed that had actually been hounded out of the British medical system by the GMC, Sarah. But he had he had been a wonderful GP in the UK for twenty five years prior. And he had used clinical symptoms to diagnose. So I'm one of those people that has, quote unquote, perfect blood scores, even though I'm hypothyroid. Yeah. And I'm That's a skinny I, yeah. hypothyroid person. So I say, oh, you can't be hypothyroid. You're too skinny. Or no, your bloods look perfect. But it, I, I felt terrible. And he said, oh, your clinical symptoms are all there. Your cortisol is zero cortisol rays in the morning, just like nothing. Uh, to the point where he said, I don't know how you're standing here. And uh, he put me on the thyroid after treating the adrenals. And within two weeks, everything was working fine. And I was pregnant for the first time. That's an amazing story. I was actually going to ask you about that because I have friends and actually my sister, people who have got all the symptoms, but just on borderline, which here in the NHS, if you're borderline, that's it. You know, you don't have it. Your bloods are fine. And in fact, most of the time, they don't even tell you what your blood is. And, and you kind of have to face that kind of Rottweiler of a receptionist who won't even give you your results half the time. But if you really push for it, you can get the results and you can see it's kind of on a, a level. So how can people kind of take this control back? I mean, I think what the message we're going to put out is you need to maintain your your um, homeostasis yourself as much as you can and of course we're promoting everything we can good light good diet good water the rest of it but how can people kind of take that control back a little bit do you think in the UK you know it's really easy my body my data right give me my data I'm entitled to it I don't care what you say I did the test you had my bloods um, the data is mine so please give it to me and sometimes you have to physically go into the GP surgery to <laughs> yeah. get it, but they will then often give it to you. You know, they may tell you and you have to write it down, but it, it is very important. And thankfully, there are now new testing companies coming out who will give you uh, the opportunity at a very low cost to get more of that data because the NHS, for instance, won't test um they're very reluctant to test reverse T3. They're reluctant to test an uh, thyroid antibodies. They often don't test T3. And then again, remember that the reference ranges are for people who are your age across the entire population. 
And I would argue that in the United Kingdom, we have far too many hypothyroid patients that are undiagnosed. And the reason why is there is no selenium in the soil in Great Britain. And you need selenium to convert T4 to T3. The same case goes for Australia. There is no selenium in Australian soil. So if you're one of those people who says, I'm buying organic and local only, well, you're not getting selenium. You're eating only local meat. Well, you're not getting selenium because those animals aren't either. And then the reference ranges are of people who include sick individuals. So it's, um, I think it's, you know, it's unfortunate, but get yourself a good functional medicine practitioner who can help you. And sometimes if you can't get that help in the UK, find a doctor who will do, who will take your labs, find a doctor in the United States or Canada who will, and get them to tell you what you need to do in order to get healthy again. Yeah, yeah. I think that is the kind of message that we, we've had quite a few doctors and things and we had we had a doctor who was talking about bioidentical hormones uh, in the States and I think it was just different messaging, but I think it is clear you can take control and you can kind of find ways around the system. Um, but tell us then about spermidine specifically because you've gone down this whole route, you're doing all this anti-inflammatory stuff. Why have you then focused on this one molecule? Well, for me, it was a very chance encounter with an Oxford immunology professor. So I live in Oxford, England. Um, this is, you know, it's like living in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you're just surrounded by fantastic scientists. And um, it was Professor Katja Simon, who was in the rheumatology department, and her, uh, you know, her researcher, Dr. Gada Alsale, they were looking at using spermidine with uh, mice that were age-matched to elderly individuals and mice that were age-matched to young people. And they were looking specifically at the flu vaccine because here in Britain, as you know, Sarah, all people over a certain age are asked to come into their GP surgery to get a vaccine every year. And what Gada and Katja were concerned about was that the antibody response in these older individuals, and I'm talking about humans, is not actually great. So they wanted to see if it was possible to raise and maintain an elevated level of antibodies after exposure to the flu vaccine if they gave a molecule like spermidine, which triggers autophagy and allows something, allows for immune cell um, it gets rid of immune cell senescence. So it gets rid of the, uh, you know, the bad immune cells, essentially, and wakes up the others. And when they did this experiment, they noticed that the young mice were actually responding. They responded well, but the older mice responded better than the young mice which is not what you would expect. You would think that, oh, it would be great if the old mice had the same response as the young mice. But in fact, they did better. They had a much better response. And the hypothesis is that it's because as we get older, we have a larger library of pathogens to which we have been exposed. So that bigger library just means that, oh yeah, I've seen, I've seen, you know, this rhinovirus before, no problem. It's just that as we get older, our immune cells sort of forget what they've seen and they don't know what the proper response is and they can't maintain it. So spermidine was able to maintain that, um, that response and it just woke up the immune cells. So that work was really exciting to me. Obviously, the anti-inflammatory aspects of polyamines, not just uh, spermidine, but spermine as well, were interesting to me as, uh, as, a, as an autoimmune patient. I'm doing everything that I can still to keep inflammation down. And then I looked online and I could just see there were over 13,000 studies on polyamines. So these are safe class of amino acids. I don't have to worry about, um, about these polyamines in food because we've been eating them. We've co-evolved with plants and these are, these are safe. So I hope that I could get them to, uh, to my mother in the United States and uh, went to a company that I knew was selling the stuff here in Europe 
uh, food derived because you do want the spermine and the putrescine too, or you want at least at least a, a precursor. And uh, they said no, they wouldn't, they couldn't send it to the United States. And I thought, okay, fine, I'm going to find it myself. And in all of the literature on food derived spermidine, we know that the highest concentrations are actually in a Japanese delicacy, fermented soybeans called natto. And it stinks. It's like having cobwebs on, you know, little styrofoam balls. Um, and the mouthfeel is, well, it's not great. Some people have described it to me as that feeling you get when you've thrown up. And, nice. you know, I mean, it's, it's just not appealing to people at all. And I thought, okay, it's but it's sort of that... in the name, Leslie. It's sort of in the name, not so. It's yeah. Not so going in my mouth. <laughs> Good way to put it. Good way to put it, Russ. Yeah. So uh, I thought, but the Japanese, they eat this all the time. They, they'd done so much research. And of course, the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology in 2016 went to Yoshinori Osumi, who's a professor in Japan, for his research on autophagy. So I thought, okay, these guys are definitely going to have a product that will do this. And I found this fantastic product that, Sarah, you've tried. And it had this balance uh, of fructooligosaccharides and polyamines, spermidine, spermine, and putrescine all together in one package. And they could show that it had all of these positive effects. So we know it increases. We know that it activates autophagy, but it had all of these beauty effects. Um, so it increased uh, keratin at upregulated keratinocytes, it, which will have an effect on skin. It was growing hair and nails, and it was increasing collagen and elastin. And I thought, this is this is a good product. I would just take it, even if I didn't know that it inhibited seventy five percent of all the hallmarks of aging. Um, you know, yeah, that's great that it helps my stem cells, but uh, actually, I just want my hair to look good, right? So I started bringing this to to market, and people began to write to me to say that they were getting really interesting results, and. Uh, you know, this is a picture of a 79 year old whose hair started to take back its pigment, you know, but at the root, which is not, that's the opposite of what we saw during COVID, right? And, you know, I have more, I have, you know, an MS patient who took it for the anti-inflammatory effects and the same thing happened to them, how it gets darker again at the root, but it's, you know, white at the end. And, uh, I began to realize that actually the beauty effects were pretty, were pretty powerful. And, you know, people like you who were saying my rosacea is going um, with the gluten-free version, we had younger people who were taking it and saying that their acne was going. So that all of that made me want to just expose people to the product, get it out there as much as I could, talk about it as much as I could. And because of, just because of the benefits, right? Uh, you know, if you're going to be 60, you, you want to do all you can to, uh, to live your best life still. We still got 40 years left. Well, exactly. We want to, we don't just want to live longer. We want to live longer, healthier lives. That's, you know, that's the goal, not longer lives. So quickly then, Leslie, because we're kind of coming short of time, which is a shame because I feel like we've only just kind of scratched the iceberg of what this can do, but we're going to, we will put it out and we'll put out the show notes, but tell people where they can um, get the product and maybe about the two products real quick, just so that we can have it, but we will of course share it after yeah, the show too. Sure. Okay, so uh, you can get Primadine Original, which is our wheat germ derived spermidine, where we take out the omega 6 polyunsaturated fatty acids because they go rancid and you don't want that rancid fat to become part of the cell membrane. You can get that and you can get Primadine GF for gluten free, which is a unique form of chlorella, an Okinawan lime peel, and turmeric, all from Okinawa. You can get those two products at Oxford Health Span, S P A N, like the span of a bridge, online. And we're very active on Instagram. 
Um, I am also involved in something called the Oxford Longevity Project. That's just all nonprofit where we explore autophagy and uh, applications to other illnesses. Uh, we've done uh, with Dale Bredesen from UCLA, we've done uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia um, with Robin Chowdhury, who's uh, Oxford's leading professor on cardiovascular disease. We've done uh, heart health. Um, we're also the only non-Japanese member of the Japan Autophagy Consortium, which the Nobel Prize winner, Professor Osumi, is the senior advisor on. So I've just been back to Japan to meet with uh, with these guys. And uh, all of the autophagy stuff uh, will be there at the Oxford Longevity Project. And then if you want the frivolous you know, YouTube videos, you can find that on Leslie's New Prime <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> Leslie's New Prime. Well, thank you so much, Leslie. I feel like we need to do a whole episode on the autophagy because we didn't even go into that. And I'm sure there'd be lots of people who don't even know what autophagy means. So it would be really lovely, Leslie, if, if you would come back and we could do a pod on that. Yeah, uh, and in course. the meantime, thank you so much for everything that you've said today. And we'll definitely send people along to all those links. It's super oh, cool. It's been great fun. Thanks a lot. Thank, yeah, thank you, you so sure. much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Breaking the crack.